This video is a thorough guide to help you prep for your system design interviews. This is part two of a three-part video series on technical interview preparation. If you have not watched the first part, I suggest watching that first. Hi guys, my name is Utsav. I'm a software engineer based in Seattle, Washington, and this channel is all about helping you excel in your software engineering careers. So if you are into that, please consider subscribing. As usual, all the reference materials from this video will be in the description below, and I have timestamps, so feel free to jump around to sections that interest you more. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this is a three-part video series on how to effectively prep for your technical interviews. Part one covers coding, part two is about system design, and part three is on the behavioral and leadership aspect of the technical interviews. While this guide can be used for most technical interviews, it is mainly geared towards big tech companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Uber, and so on and so forth. And finally, each of of these videos are long and very dense, so you'll likely either have to take notes as you watch them or use them as a reference and revisit sections as you need them. All three videos in this series are divided into three main sections. First, I'll explain the purpose of this type of interview and how much time you should spend preparing for them. Second, I'll recommend resources that you need before starting your prep. And third, I'll talk about the strategy to use when prepping for the specific type of interview. All right, let's get started with the system design interview. System design interviews exist to test your design and architectural accuracy and are mostly applicable to folks with at least a few years of experience. These interviews also are prevalent for positions that involve web-based architectures and distributed systems. And for mid to experienced engineer, system design interview is generally used for leveling as well. Your system design prep will ideally begin long before your interviews, because unlike coding interviews, which are very objective, system design interviews are vague and subjective. There is no right solution, there is no optimal solution, there is no wrong solution. Some designs are better than others, but most solutions will fall somewhere in between amazing and horrible. And that gradient is why interviewers love design questions because they get a lot of signal about the candidate. But on the other side, candidates tend to not like design interviews that much because it's vague and subjective. But finding the best solution isn't even the point of these interviews. It's more like a discussion between two engineers uh, about the choices involved in solving a problem and the trade-offs around them. And because of this, the interview can literally go in any direction. So naturally, there's a lot of topics to cover. And for that reason, cramming your system design interview prep into a three to six month period like coding interviews isn't advisable unless you have no other choice. My advice is to give yourself at least one year, if not more, to get better at designing systems. Start Start by reading books, blogs, articles long before your interviews, not just as a means to an end, but out of curiosity and interest. This will set you up for success on the long term. So let's talk about some of the resources that will help you along the way. These are some books that I highly recommend. I'm not going to go into detail on why I recommend these. Uh, if you're interested in that, I have a dedicated video just for all the system design books. So check that out. I'll link it in the description below. So if you're a mid-level engineer, you should at least read these two books. The first one is Web Scalability for Startup Engineers. And the second one is System Design Interview. If you are a mid to senior level engineer, you should read two more books in addition to the ones that I just mentioned. The first one is Designing Data Intensive Applications, and the second one is Building Microservices. There are also a lot of books on specific technologies and processes like Kafka, Cassandra, graph databases, and event-driven architectures that are sometimes offered for free by companies like Confluent, Neo4j, and Datastax. So you can check their sites to see if you can find any for free. Either way, I'll add those and other supplemental books in the description below. There are also a lot of free videos on YouTube and a lot of blogs and articles that cover topics around scalable systems that are scattered all over the place. There are too many to mention within this video, but I'll share the entire list of free resources in the description below. Either way, I suggest that you spend at least six months reading up on these resources and going through these courses to build your knowledge around scalable systems. Only then move on to the interview preparation strategy. So let's say you've gone through and reviewed a bunch of resources for about six months and now are fairly confident that you understand the overall landscape of designing scalable systems. This is where you start working on a strategy to refine your interviewing skills. I've had good success using a six step system when it comes to prepping for system design interviews. Step one, understand how system design interviews should be divided into four key sections. Step two, catalog all the interview questions. Step three, practice interview questions in individual sections. Step four, identify and invest on your strengths and interests. Step five, build a few systems end to end. And step six, practice the interview questions in full under a timed setting. 
I suggest spending at least another six months into the strategy part. So basically you have six months to read and acquire knowledge and another six months to practice the strategy for a total prep time of one year. If you have less time, split your time accordingly. Okay, so let's look at these steps in more detail. Regardless of how vague and conversational system design interviews may seem, to do well on them, you will still have to follow a set game plan, very much like coding interviews. The first step of that is understanding what exactly goes on in a system design interview and how they should be divided into four key sections. As I mentioned before, in a system design interview, you'll be given a very vague problem. For example, design Facebook, or design YouTube, or design a rate limiter, design Google Docs, so on and so forth. At the surface, these may seem like ridiculous things to ask a candidate to design in 45 minutes. But that is not what a design interview is about. The expectation isn't for you to really design Facebook in under 45 minutes, that would just be silly, but it is to see if you can meaningfully tackle a vague problem. Think of it this way. If two engineers were given a random problem and about one hour to discuss potential solutions on a whiteboard, what would that conversation look like? Would you expect them to design the whole system? No. But would you expect them to attack the problem from different angles, break it down, draw from their own knowledge and experiences, and try to come up with a reasonable starting point? Yeah. So that's exactly what a design interview is. Okay, so let's try to make these four sections a little bit more concrete. So you're given a vague problem. Let's say design a social network like Facebook. You have 45 minutes to complete the design, take away five minutes for opening and closing the interview. So you, that's basically around 40 minutes for the actual interview. So the first section is to simplify the requirements. This is also referred to as functional requirement. You should expect to spend around five minutes in this section. So, okay, in this case, Facebook is pretty complex. Let's verify what designing Facebook really means and perhaps simplify the problem. We definitely need for people to be friends with one another. We need people to be able to post updates like statuses, pictures, videos. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity, maybe we could assume that the updates are only text for now. We also need some form of feed so users can see their friends' updates. Uh, and obviously, Facebook also has a lot more features like stories, marketplace, gaming. But maybe we can keep it simple and skip all those for now. If you say this to an interviewer, they will almost always agree with you. This is already a great signal. You have taken a vague problem, identified that the problem is quite complex, and have broken it down to a few simple parts that is feasible to discuss within a short window of time. It isn't mandatory, but this is also a good place to come up with a few API signatures to make these requirements even more concrete. For example, you could have API signatures for creating a post, adding or removing a friend, and fetching the feed in this example. Section two is to identify the constraints. This is also referred to as non-functional requirements. You should again plan to spend another five minutes in this section. You'll be asking a lot of important questions in this section to come up with the traffic and usage assumptions. For example, how many total users are we talking about? Are they geographically distributed? Do we know their activity patterns? What does a typical activity look like? So total users at the very least will give you some storage requirements. A geographically distributed user base can pose unique challenges when it comes to consistency and latency. Activity pattern is generally what dictates your bandwidth and throughput peaks. Uh, for example, if you have 100 million users total, but only 20% are active users and almost all of them are active in the mornings or evenings, this is a completely different scenario than assuming that all 100 million users are active all the time, right? And your typical activity will give you additional insight. Say, for example, a typical user activity may be three pages of feed scrolling and one status update per day. So based on these assumptions and questions, you can come up with your storage requirements per day and for the long term. You can come up with your read and write query per second requirements as well and a lot of other things that may be useful to you. Obviously, you can ask more questions and come up with more constraints and numbers, but a few of these critical questions should be enough to get you started. Also, the math involved in this is pretty basic napkin math, and you'll be fine if you're slightly off, as long as the error is not off by orders of magnitude. Uh, the idea is to estimate reasonably without getting lost, and this is an important step because it also gives you a good idea and even clues on how we want to design the system. But at the same time, everything here is an assumption. Inexperienced engineers may ask for those numbers from the interview viewer, but senior engineers will be expected to assert what's reasonable. Okay, so the third section is to identify a high-level design that could work, then recognize some key challenges. You should plan on spending about 15 minutes in this section. 
Keep in mind that this is not a detailed design. This is basically the step where you recognize and acknowledge the main components necessary to complete this design. Uh, simple block diagrams to represent databases, caches, message queue, app server, web server, load balancer, and maybe a client device should be enough. At this stage, you'll also pick out core technologies that you'll be going with. For example, SQL or NoSQL. What sort of replication or redundancy are you thinking of? Will the queue be a simple queue or a distributed queue? What type of load balancing are you thinking of? Would rate limiting be required? If so, what kind of bucketing or window are you thinking of? You get the idea. Once you've come up with a reasonable high-level design, it's time to evaluate what may be the key pain points with this system or what factors make this problem a challenging one. Is it throughput, bandwidth, latency, consistency, or something else. For example, for something like Facebook or any other social network, one key challenge will always be the fan out problem. So basically your design to build the user's feed could be a simple pull model where you pull updates from everyone that user is following and combine that to build the user's feed, right? But then what if someone follows a lot of people? That's going to take a lot of time, right? So another approach could be a push model where every time a user has an update, you push that change to all of their followers. That could work, but what about celebrities who are followed by millions of people, right? That could take a lot of time. So perhaps a hybrid model is ideal, like a pull model for regular people and maybe a push model for celebrities. Um, there could also be data hotspots. For example, when a celebrity posts an update, millions of people are gonna like it. And the backing data structure for that counter is gonna get really hot. So you'll need to handle that somehow, maybe split it into multiple counters for celebrities, maybe sacrifice consistency because who cares about the difference between 1 million and 1 0.001 million as long as it's eventually consistent, right? Or perhaps use like special data types like CRDTs that certain databases like Cassandra support. Either way, identifying these challenges will give you ideas on how you want to design or how you want to evolve your high level design into more detailed design. And to that end, section four is deep diving into one or more components. And you should also spend around 15 minutes in this section. This is where you play to your strengths. If you have experience in data stores, you may want to deep dive on how to handle the hotspots that we just talked about. If you have worked with message queues a lot, you should talk about how queues and asynchronous messaging plays a critical part into your design. If you are a middleware person, talk about the feed API and how you can effectively fetch the feeds, handle pagination, versioning, data compression, and things like that. Uh, if you are a mobile engineer, talk about battery life and how you can optimize your design for that or, or for low bandwidth areas like third countries. This part is rarely premeditated and often open-ended enough where you can drive the conversations towards areas that you're experienced in. Very rarely this may be something that is totally outside your comfort zone but you should still focus on drawing from your past experiences to drive that conversation in the direction you want. Okay, now that you know how a system design interview should be structured, you should start cataloging all the potential systems that you could be asked to design. The good news here is that unlike coding interviews, there are only a limited set of categories that most systems fall under. And even better news is that once you have designed one system in a particular category, the rest of them are pretty similar. For example, if you know how to design Facebook, you basically know how to design Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, or any other social network. They may have some differences, but the idea is basically the same. If you know how to design WhatsApp, you know how messaging works for Facebook Messenger or Viber or Slack or Microsoft Teams. You get the idea. I'll share my Notion template for all of the categories and questions in the description below, and those should be enough to give you thorough practice. As exciting as it is at this point to go and try to design the entire system, I will ask you to refrain from doing that. Go through each of the problems in the list and work through them one section at a time. For example, let's say you only have three problems to go through. In reality, you'll have more like 50 problems, but for the sake of this example, let's say you just have three problems. Design Facebook, design WhatsApp, and design Google Docs. Okay, so when you first start, you will pick design Facebook and only work on the first section of the interview structure we discussed in step one. That is identifying and simplifying requirements. Just spend time thinking about what features you would need for Facebook. It's okay if it takes you an hour, don't worry about it. Once you're done, visit the real Facebook and see if you made correct assumptions. Then move on to the next question, design WhatsApp and do the same. 
Then go into the third one, design Google Docs and do the same. Once you have done the first section for all of your questions, you will repeat all the questions again. But this time you'll be working on only section two of the interview structures, the non-functional requirements. This is where you identify the numbers like the users, bandwidth, thresholds, read, write, QPS, so on and so forth. Again, it's okay if it takes you a long time at the beginning, your speed will improve as you practice more. Once you have finished all the questions on the second section, you will work through all of them for the third section. And then finally, you'll work through all of them for the fourth section. The reason for going through them one section at a time is to create a repetition. You'll be working through the same exercise around 50 or so times back to back, which will build muscle memory. As you work on each section, you'll also get better at it and eventually hit the recommended times for those sections. So as you work through each of these sections for all of your problems, you'll notice that you naturally gravitate or lean towards certain components. This could be because of interest, existing knowledge, or your comfort, whatever it is. That area is your strength. If you're a data person, you'll mostly always try to deep dive on databases. If you like caching, you'll probably deep dive into different caching strategies. But whatever that is, take note of that because you'll use that information to drive conversations in your real interview towards your strengths. And for that reason, you'll also need to invest more on those areas. For example, if you always find yourself deep diving in the data layer, you can't always be just using SQL, right? Uh, spend time understanding the different data storage options and their pros and cons. How does MySQL compare to SQL Server or Oracle? When would you use Cassandra versus Dynamo versus Bigtable? Are they similar, different? If so, how? Learn things in depth. How does Cassandra's gossip protocol work? What does the Murmur 3 algorithm do? How are previous and next successors stored in each node? Maybe a binary search tree, maybe some other data structure. How would you go about finding the next successor of a node that needs to be taken offline? What are tombstones? How does the write log work? Well, you get the idea. If you are naturally attracted to a certain component of an overall design, that is a great choice for you to express your in-depth knowledge in. But obviously to do that, you will need to build that in-depth knowledge in those areas first. Okay, so far you have cataloged a set of problems to work on, you've worked through all of them one section at a time, identified and invested on improving your strengths, great, you're almost there. But there's one huge piece of the puzzle that is still missing. If you've never built a system in real life, all this is only theoretical knowledge. And that is maybe okay if you have two to five years of experience, but as senior engineers, it won't fly. Why? Because you'll be talking about everything in very generic sense. You'll say how you would arrange load balancers, what kind of caching strategy we'd use, how you'd go about setting up replications, etc. All good, but people that have worked on those systems in real life will use specific examples. They will mention actual technologies they've used like Nginx for load balancing or reverse boxing. Uh, they will talk about specific caching system they've used like Memcache or Redis. Uh, they will talk about specific databases like Cassandra and how they would set up replication there instead of just saying generic terms like NoSQL. Until you build a system end to end, it will be very apparent that your knowledge is purely theoretical. But the good news is that thanks to cloud services like AWS, Azure, GCS, you can build these end-to-end -end systems very easily. Sure, ideally you would have built a real system with real traffic volume, but when you don't have that, this is the next best thing. You will at least learn about the specific technologies, their configurations and integration. And this is a much better position to be than just building a generic design. If you're short in time, pick one problem and build it end-to-end, -end, but my recommendation is to at least try to build three different systems. Okay, by now you're probably around the 10th or 11th month mark of your system design interview prep, and this is finally the time for you to pick 10 to 15 questions from the original list and practice them like you would in a real interview where you complete each section within the suggested time we mentioned in step one and complete the entire design in under 40 minutes. This should be fairly simple to you now if you have done all the prior steps properly. And that's that, you're ready to nail your system design interview.